This presentation is using Lucene and Solar to surface the big data of social media. My name is Glenn Engstrand. I'm senior software engineer for the platform team at Zeusk. I know you guys are still digesting uh, your meals, so I thought I'd start with a little audience participation phase. How many folks here, show by the raise of hand, <clears throat> are more interested in or prefer that I would focus on developer issues? All right, good, thanks. And uh, one more, how many folks here uh, raise your hand if you like demos and wish that I spent more time in the demo versus, and then afterwards I'll ask if you just like to see slides, more focus on slides. So demos, you like demos? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, I'll focus more on that. Try to, you know, accommodate. Anyway, so let's get, let's uh, dig right in and see what we can come up with. Okay, so this is the big data track, but what is big data? As we know, big data means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. After all, it's an industry buzzword at this point. There's quite a bit of media pushing big, big data this, big data that. We're going to focus, I'm going to first talk about what we're going to focus on, the aspects of big data that are relevant to this particular presentation. And uh, it's pretty much three things. Uh, how big is the data? How much data do you actually have that you need to search? What is the rate of data? How, quick, how quickly are new documents coming into your solar index? And also shelf life is a characteristic for big data. Um, if it has a short shelf life, that is to say its relevancy doesn't last very long. And that also uh, makes things a little more complicated rather than say something has a long shelf life that you can index once and it'll just stay in your index forever and doesn't really matter. What's not going to be in this presentation are uh, actually the most common case for big data, which is analytics. Um, that's when you're going to want to really do a Hadoop integration. And uh, at Zeus we do use Hadoop, but it's just not the focus of this conversation. And the other thing I'm not going to really focus on are the more advanced search features of solar, such as inverse document frequency and things like that. <coughs> okay, so what's social media? You probably, okay, another audience participation question. How many people here use Facebook? Okay, I'm not surprised, so I don't really have to spend a lot of time on this slide because you already know what social media is. In a social media application, you're going to have something called a social graph where users are connected or related to each other, usually, usually in the form of friends. There's some aspect of sharing where you upload content and you expect your friends to see the content. There's a notion of affinity where users are encouraged to like content and that also is broadcasted to your social graph. And what users actually do may become content in and of themselves, such as new friending or whatnot. Who are we? What is Zeusk? Well, you may have noticed uh, a couple of years back some commercials, some national commercials we ran that featured Zeusk as an online dating website. Since then, we've evolved into what we call a romantic social network. What we want to do is capture the full life cycle of your romantic interests, not just the dating cycle. The website is only the tip of the iceberg. We also do a lot of email campaigns and try to re-engage users through real-time communications and other social networks such as Facebook. The graph you see behind uh, this slide is the number of documents in a particular solar index uh, in the first month that we started it up. And we currently increase that number of documents by about 6 million a day. So I would contend that that is an example of big data. What is solar? I think most of you are probably already familiar with solar. Actually, I'd like to ask another audience participation question. How many people here are new to solar? Okay, some. So not many, though, so I'll blow through this slide pretty quick as well. Obviously, solar is all about search. Uh, it has a lot of very advanced search features. Um, it's also about being a distributed system. We're going to go into a little more detail about that, but you know, it's rare in a big data application that you would be using a single ser solar search database. And um, it has very sophisticated caching, which makes it very compelling in terms of it being high performance. We're going to go into detail about all that. Furthermore, even though technically Solar is not a NoSQL solution. I'm going to focus on Solar through the lens of NoSQL because there's a lot of similarities between Solar and NoSQL that I think make it very relevant for big data. Okay, what is search? Obviously, you have the ability to query. 
is very advanced, sophisticated query capability. Um, you can, my name is uh, Martijn van Groningen. Uh, queries. I work for search uh, workings. By date ranges. Uh, I am a uh, Lucene committer and PMC now. member. Of course, of the Lucene Boolean algebra. And I don't have to today, I, my talk will be about uh, grouping and joining. With. You can use fuzzy queries. I mean, the list goes on and on. Equally important is the notion of ranking or sorting in Solar. It has some very sophisticated uh, sorting uh, capability, which we're also going to talk about go into a little more detail. One of our solar instances require that sorting be very dynamic, that it, um, it has to sort on a wide variety of different uh, differences between the user doing the request and, of course, uh, the individual documents. Some of those differences are based on location. Uh, it's basically a vector. You know, you can vectorize the document, you can vectorize the user, you compute the distance in the two vectors, and that's what you rank by. But we also have a stochastic component to the search as well, because when we want people to research later, we want to show them different search results. We don't want to always show them the same thing. You know. <clears throat> Solar is highly distributed. It does this through basically I think this is two um, feature sets that it has, a concept of replication, where, of course, you have a, a single master and you have some group of slaves. That's how you balance the load. Search load is amongst the, the, the read slave pool. And those slave instances of solar all replicate uh, their index from the master. And then you have the notion of sharding, where you have multiple masters. And uh, the entire search space is actually partitioned amongst those masters. And then typically what happens, especially with solar, it's a very cool feature. You reserve some servers. Uh, just kind of as the front end where the queries come in. And then it, uh, it's a special parameters that you do, and it shards, basically. It makes the same request to all these masters. Well, actually, that's not true. It makes the same request to all these, the VIP of all these read slaves, pulls back the data, aggregates it, and then brings it back uh, uh, to the client. And those are the two, way, the two most common ways that Solar is distributed. So how does Solar caching come into play? Well, there's three different types of caches. And they are all very sophisticated and require a lot of different parameters and keep on top of. Of course, the individual documents of the index themselves can be cached. The, there is um, a notion of a filter, which is basically a reusable part of a query. And that can be cached into memory. And uh, there's also the query results. So you send the query, you get back the results. It's sorted in a certain way. Those results and how they're sorted can also be cached. Uh, there's various parameters, tuning sizes that you can do with query results, such as the window size. How, even though the request might be for a certain number of rows, how far ahead do I look and cache those results? And then there's an overall max docs cached uh, so that you don't end up putting too much query results in the cache and eating up all the memory and not allowing other queries to go through. All of these types of things that get cached, there's an initial size and a max size. And for some of them, there's this notion of auto warming. So every time you do a commit or you um, snap, uh, a replication snap happens, the, um, uh, the caches get flushed. And so um, that means they're empty, and so you can't leverage any of that stuff in memory. But what you can do is have it automatically run some queries, like the latest queries usually, that will sort of pre-warm the cache for you. Does that make any sense? Is that interesting or relevant? Or you guys are bored? Because after all, you already knew that. And why, why am I boring you with this stuff? Yes? No? All right. So how is Solar like a NoSQL solution? Um, who here is familiar with NoSQL? Or is that NoSQL? Raise your hand. You have some. So I'll go through this quickly. So you know, it's all about Brewer's cap theorem as far as NoSQL is concerned, um, which is going to be, as you can see in the diagram, or the little drawing on the right-hand side, all about availability, partitioning, and consistency. Different solutions to it. And uh, like many NoSQL solutions, such as MongoDB and Cassandra, Solar is highly available. You use replication, you load balancing these read slaves, a request comes in, if solar die, if one instance of solar dies, the request just goes to the next instance. It's all very easy. It's partition tolerant. Um, even if a master dies, of course, requests are still going to the read slaves. You swap the master out with the standby, you get the latest backup up to date, maybe you run some transactions in a transaction logger to replay it and then you're ready to go again from the master side. But like MongoDB and Cassandra, why thing, where things get a little uh, rough is in the consistency dimension. Uh, in the NoSQL folks, oh, we call it eventually consistent. But basically what that means, and what your 
users and product managers come to you with the complaint of is, gee, I just updated this document, and when I fetch it again, it's my old results. What happened? Well, what happened was the update went to the master, and you did a fetch before the replication interval passed. And so what he's reading is the instant copy of that document on the read slave. Once the replication happens, of course, it'll be caught up. So Solar, like most NoSQL solutions, is probably not relevant for things where that degree of accuracy is important, um, such as, say, financial markets. You know, when your stock hits the trading room floor, you want to be very clear about um, 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 you want to be very clear about when it hit, but for social media, it's fine. So what do we do, well, how do we run Solar at Zeusk? We have three apps, like I've said before, user profile search, which is kind of the heart and soul of what we call the personals app, where you see you're interested in dating and you want to see uh, potential candidates. Uh, you can see this in an online way. We also do uh, email campaigns that use the uh, Solar Index um, to uh, email you potential candidates. Then there's the news feed, very much a social media thing. We've already talked about what it, what it uh, does. And a new product coming out called Find Your Partner. Basically, it's just ability to, uh, like a Google Suggest ability, where you're typing to find your partner, and it scans through its list of uh, Zeus users and comes back and gives you matches based on a partial match. So now we get to the, pin, the, 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 um, the most important slide of this entire presentation, which is, if there's only three things you get out of this presentation as far as how to scale solar up to big data, it's these three things. Service-oriented architecture is your friend. When updating the index, it's all about scalability. When searching the index, it's all about performance. Everything I'm going to talk about after this is just details that iterate on these three common themes. So at, at Zeus, uh, we have a you know, fairly uh, sophisticated and complex engineering structure. Of course, I'm a member of the platform team. We're responsible for solar. Our consumers are members of the API finance team. Uh, their consumers are members of all these different developers of all these different teams, uh, platform, um, mobile, web. We have a desktop product. We have a touch product. All that complexity can only be managed if we, have well, if we pu publish well-defined endpoints which specify, of course, you know, a well-articulated contractual agreement as to what those endpoints will do. Uh, platform team, because it wants to own the actual uh, communication with Solar, also provides thin wrappers on the client stack uh, so that if we need to change how we interact with Solar, we don't have to ask other developers to change their code. They always call the, this well-defined API, and as far as the actual communication protocol with Solar, that is not a part of the contractual agreement. And because this is a highly scalable, um, large volume application, the server stack has to be well instrumented so that we can shape traffic or perhaps degrade functionality based on changes in uh, load. And in order to find out whether we need to do that, we need to graph our operational metrics in real time. As far as uh, rights are concerned, uh, the the I'm going to call it the synchronizer. Basically, it's the service that keeps solar up to date with changes in our system. Uh, it needs to be multi-threaded to take full advantage of the hardware. It needs, writes need to be asynchronous. There's no reason why the user needs to wait for an update. It's fire and forget. It needs to be multi-processed because, hey, we've got a, the synchronizer has to scale out just like solar does. Yes, it is all about scaling out. It's all about scalability. When you're talking about six million new documents a day, yeah, there's going to come a day when one solar instance is going to handle it. There's going to come a day when one anything is going to handle it. You need to be able to scale out everything. So let's talk a little bit about reads. It's actually pretty easy. Um, the user wants to see the news feed or the user profile search or what have you very quickly. And so it's all about performance. For that reason, we designed the schema for a uh, newsfeed to, to have the simplest and uh, least costly search uh, imaginable. We want to keep the load on the updating, not on the, the reading. The reading should be very fast. For newsfeed, we, it's less than one millisecond to pull back the results. And we've got to be able to have enough headroom on the servers to handle bursts. You know, the next viral video game that marketing pushes out and all of a sudden we've got huge amount of traffic.
hitting the news feed, which by the way is the home page when you log in. So we need to be able to handle huge bursts of traffic as well. Let me review quickly the news feed structure um, um, so that uh, when I go through the rest of this, you'll understand the information architecture that I'm working with. Users post romantic moments on their news feed and other profile pictures, on other people's profiles. Those romantic moments include text and photos. Sometimes users will do things that generate moments automatically, such as friending somebody. Users are allowed to like romantic moments, and they're also allowed to comment on romantic moments. In fact, why don't we go through a demo quickly uh, in order to show you what that looks like. Okay. Here we go. Very short. This is so quick, you probably wouldn't even think of it as a, um, as a specially sophisticated or interesting application. User logs in. Presented with the news feed. They can post a moment, upload an image. Pretty obvious stuff. You probably do this all the time on Facebook. This was on a busy day for us, for our, so our photo uploads were running a little bit slow. You can see there was a little bit of a lag there. They can also uh, like other moments. Most of these, as you can see, are auto-generated moments. And they can comment on a moment. That's the Transamerica building. It's right across the street from where we work. Pretty simple. All right. Okay, continuing. <clears throat> so let's deep dive into the architecture uh, itself, mostly focusing on newsfeed, but I might go over to user profile a little bit as well. Pretty straightforward. We have a front end. This isn't the web tier serving web pages to the user. This is the front end to solar, the solar appliances. We have a middle tier, uh, like the synchronizer and some jobs that keep solar up to date. And we have data stores where we have solar and the MySQL databases that solar pulls its information ultimately from. Um, we need to mark the parents. Front end, like and said, we have an effective method for product and effective method for product um, item. Does most of the calls for the Find your partner application. We decided that we didn't want to incur the much overhead of loading all those PHP libraries, especially for something that has to be as quick as typing and, and keeping up. So we use good old fashioned Jetty. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You know, a very simple uh, uh, Java servlet app container. It's easy to embed, easy to use, and for the load uh, for uh, Find your partner, it's a good choice. And because messages, the update messages have to be asynchronous. We use an ASMQ, or asynchronous message queuing, a broker called RabbitMQ. It's written in Erlang. It's very stable. It's very fast. Uh, we use it just as a, um, a broker. We don't really use a lot of the sophisticated features in, in uh, ASMQ. So we auto-acknowledge, and we, um, uh, we don't make them persistent queues. It's not like it's going to stay in Rabbit for a long time. We just need an asynchronous way of communicating. On the middle tier, of course, we have solar. Solar, uh, some of the uh, workers that keep solar up to date use other open source technologies such as Spring and EHCache, which is a Java-based uh, caching mechanism. Go into more detail on that. Solar, for user profile search, which is a little more sophisticated, has um, uh, function queries. We just extend, it's a way, our way of extending some of the logic uh, some of the search and sorting capability uh, in the JVM of Solar itself, and it's a way that Solar uh, allows you to extend that. And we also use request handlers. Um, what we use that for is, uh, I'll go into a little more detail when I talk about EHCache, but we use that when we, we also keep EHCache in the JVM of Solar uh, because some of the fields for user profiles have a very short shelf life, and yet our replication interval... So you need to decide how... So what we do is we put EH cache in front of solar in order to cache those values that change since the last uh, replication snap. And then uh, we use a request handler so that our XMPP servers can notify solar that this change has happened. 
Spring, how many people know of spring? Yeah, so yeah, you know what spring is. I don't have to explain spring to you. What we use, it's a, um, uh, a very stable, mature framework, uh, web-based framework. What we, it does all kinds of things. It's lightweight, it's loosely coupled. What we use it for is dependency injection, where we can create an object hierarchy based on basically this XML configuration. We use it uh, to do a lot of the configuration stuff for us. And we also use a low-level part of Spring dealing with aspect-oriented programming called method interception. That allows us at configuration time to specify certain perhaps non-critical features such as pruning news feeds of older uh, moments so that we can turn that off and on based on, to be able to, based on um, you know, what the load is like. So in a low load situation, we'll want to do that pruning, but those are deletes. So in a high load situation, we'll want to turn that pruning off and just turn it on later uh, when we get back into a low load environment. Like I said, EH cache is a caching mechanism. We use it in the JVM of solar for uh, a field that has a short, um, a very short shelf life. Basically, in user profile, most of the fields have a long shelf life. Um, where you live, um, uh, what date you were born, hey, that doesn't change very often. And so because of it, we have a long replication polling interval so that we can leverage solar's caches better. But there's this one field, online now, changes all the time. Uh, if you're on the mobile product, you can be online and offline as you go under a bridge. Uh, if you're on the desktop product, you might be going online and offline as you walk away from the, uh, the computer and it, it, it you know, goes idle for a while. And because that has such a short shelf life, we have to use that trick where I was saying we use the solar request handler, a special request handler we coded, and to update the cache. And then in the function query, we check that cache. And even after the replication interval snaps, that cache doesn't change because it's not managed by solar. But there are some parameters to EH cache you have to be aware of. You have to understand your caching topology. For us, it's very simple. Uh, no replication, uh, basic write through cache. Um, we want to keep the objects in memory as long as possible. The only time we really evict the object is when we're getting low on memory. And we don't care about overflowing disk because we just get it back out of the database anyway. <clears throat> So what are the data stores involved? Well, obviously, the most important data store we like here is Lucene. Uh, but we, you know, solar can't be the authoritative reference for data. You've got to be able to rebuild the index from something. And that, those are various MySQL clusters. And we use this open source transaction logger called Howl uh, because, as I'll explain in a little bit, you know, when you're, um, there are times when you want to replay transactions in order to get your index back up to speed. So, why is solar more awesome than MongoDB and Cassandra as far as a NoSQL, looking through the NoSQL lens? Okay, hey, someone's going to answer this. Guess awesome. Uh, storing binary sequences. Well, that is true, actually. That is another reason why, uh, obviously, a very obvious reason why solar is more awesome than MongoDB and, and Cassandra. You're right about that. Uh, and another reason on top of that is when you write to Mongo or Cassandra, you lock the entire database. Not for a long time, but you still lock it. When your rates of transaction are high enough, that not a long time becomes a deal breaker. But with Lucene, because they have this notion of index readers, yes, when you're committing, first of all, you can batch writes to a commit, right? We have our batch size set to uh, 400 for, uh, for newsfeed and only the for user profile. In other words, 500 writes. Cause, triggers a commit in solar. Uh, but when you do some um, commit, yes, it locks that index reader, but read requests still go through because they go to the old index reader um, until this index reader, until the commit is finally done and then all the requests go to the new index reader. In 4.0, you have even more control over that uh, functionality. And uh, the other cool thing about Lucene is uh, segments in which um, that's where the actual uh, index is mapped to files in a file system used to be that you had to care about that. You had to worry about tuning your merge factor. But you know, now Lucene's algorithms for rebalancing and automatically uh, merging it makes it such it becomes a non-issue. Just to give you, uh, well, actually, I'll wait. And I'll, I'll say this in just a minute. On the MySQL side, we have just a huge number of uh, databases. Um, Procona gets a, makes a lot of money off of us. We have a cluster 
of MySQL databases where we store moments, another cluster for members, another cluster for user information. We also have a global cluster that maps user to the shard. All of these, except for global, all of these are sharded, which is kind of the MySQL way or the relational database way of handling big data. So you, you come in with a user ID, but there's actually multiple databases, right? And users are partitioned amongst those databases. It has to map to the, um, 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 the particular shard number, right, in order to go any farther. And by the way, each one of these shards is an MMM cluster in and of itself of multiple masters, multiple readers. We're talking over 120 databases here. Oh, and right now, as far as newsfeed, we're running on one master. One master handles what normally it would take 120 MySQL databases. Philip. So, there's something to be said. Four about. years ago it started. I'm not saying and, you'll never uh, have to shard. I believe of last year it was shard, uh, finally committed. But, uh, day, but in the process but we of getting it committed, to, we haven't had to turn that on. Which is good because we're running low on servers. So you have to rebuild um, Solar Index. It's not an authoritative uh, re reference for your data. We still need those MySQL databases um, in order to store that data so that we can rebuild an index. And that rebuild takes a long time. You know, I haven't run it in a couple of days. The last time I ran, well, I haven't run it in a couple of weeks, actually. We grow at six million a day. The last time I ran it, it took four days to run. So what do you do? Well, you don't want to lose the transactions that are coming in while you're rebuilding the index, because that's loss of a lot of data. So you have to log all of those transactions somewhere. We use Howl, so that once the re-index is finished, you replay the log to catch it up. There's various parameters you need to know about when using Howl. Um, how, what's the maximum record size for a transaction? Uh, how many records are going to get stored into a block? And how often do you want to write that block out to disk? You know, so you, you want to set those to have however you feel comfortable with your safety versus speed. So let's talk a little bit about deployment. Okay, and also let's speed up a little bit. So we got, um, we also have web tier, of course, solar, the search appliance and a set of workers. These are the synchronizers that keep the search appliance up to date. On the web tier, we've got sort of a gatekeeper. Like I was saying, we use Jetty for that and also uh, for um, uh, user profile search and newsfeed search, just the API tier is our gatekeeper. Those are the things that authenticate the user, uh, keep distributed denial of service attacks from happening, make sure there's no injection attacks, because solar, by the way, I hope no one here is running solar in front of the firewall. It's not really recommended, best practice to do that. Solar is really not, you know, responsible for those kind of things. It, it's, it should be, you know, you don't really want people outside of your, uh, your uh, cage accessing solar directly. Of course, like I said, we have that web API layer. It's about 50 uh, Apache servers running PHP. On the solar search appliance side, obviously this is running solar. Uh, we do uh, use uh, read slaves, uh, virtual IP, load balanced. You know, when we need to do something with them, we tech ops people drain each one from the pool. Uh, it's a great, you know, we make the upgrade or change whatever we have to make and then add it back to the pool. It's a great way of uh, handling, uh, making sure that uh, each appliance is available. And uh, uh, also uh, there is this notion of write masters. For newsfeed, we won't actually have to use what's called solar sharding because uh, a user's newsfeed will always stay in one single master. So we don't actually have to shard the results. But whenever you have multiple masters, you know, each one of those masters is going to have a read pool, right, that replicates from that pool. So think of it as a cluster of clusters. On the worker side, these are, like I said, there's a synchronizer service that takes these asynchronous messages sent by the API and updates the solar master based on that. We also have this re-indexer batch job, runs very infrequently, and the ability to recover from a transaction log. Like I said, re-indexes, they're very operationally expensive. You're probably not going to do them very often. All right, so I do have time to run the load test demo. First of all, let's show you some real-world data. Uh, oh, wow, look at that. When you do that, it just sort of, uh, will I get, yes, good. So this is the load running on our three workers right now. Um, as you can see, we're running about, um, I would say, 500, 700, almost 800 uh, new romantic moments per minute. 
are going into the system. And um, I should say at this point, but because there is a social graph, when a new romantic moment comes in, that moment is propagated to everyone's newsfeed. So even though it looks like it's 700 coming in, then as far as document size on the index, that gets exploded because, as it turns out, people have a lot of friends in Zeusk. Um, we keep a lot of these operational. We have this notion of a pending queue. Uh, why does it do that? Right now, there's nothing in the queue. Uh, pending queue is we have these internal queues. You, handle, you do that a lot in multi-threaded programming. You've got consumers and producers. and We keep all these transactions queued up in pending queues for different producers to service. And if it starts backing up, you're in trouble, right? That's when you have to start sh uh, shifting traffic and, and doing stuff. Let's see. Yes, we always have this rush right at 8 o'clock. It's weird. On the, uh, in, big, in the world of big data, there's a rush hour. And strangely enough, digital rush hour is not unlike car rush hour. We always have this big uh, uh, rush coming in right at 8 a.m. in the morning. These are, um, this is Pacific time, by the way. So let's play around and have some fun with um, um, running solar right here on my desktop and pulling up, some, uh, pulling up some performance metrics. Obviously, whoops, classic mistake. All right, so let's crank up solar. Crank, crank up some MySQL. All right. Looks good. We, uh, of course, this is uh, the synchronizer is written in Java, and we have JUnit tests so that we can, you know, assure ourselves that maybe, you know, recent code changes aren't really stupid. And I'm, I just put those JUnit tests in a JMeter run, so I thought I would just run that. Uh, whoops, except I'm in the wrong folder. Other than that, it was a good idea. You can see that good. Need to position this a little differently. And while we're running this, we're just going to go ahead and take a look at what solar's doing. In terms of memory and classes and threads and stuff like that. So as you can see right now, solar is somewhat bored. Oh, that's interesting, the screen resolution. Well, I'm going to have to show you just basically threads and heat memory. And we're going to crank this up. In this particular uh, JMeter thing, we're just going to do new romantic moments and new likes. Uh, I think I do um, uh, the loop counter is a, a 10. I think the thread group, I think I'm only using five threads because this is, after all, a laptop. And um, I think I run 500 transactions overall. Go to the graph. Oh, wow, that's really hard to see. Yeah. Pull that back a little bit. Okay. So it's starting to crank up. I don't know how well you can see this. The uh, graph on the right is uh, response times as, um, as reported by Jamie. So what it's doing is it's calling 10 new documents and creating 10 new romantic moments and 10 likes. And right now, the average response time for that is ooh, eight seconds, less than awesome. And this is uh, heat memory usage as it's being uh, displayed on, um, within the solar JVM. Things are starting to crank up a little bit. Yes, I'm well in time. Well, while this thing is cranking up, does anyone have any questions so far? You've been so quiet. That must mean I'm really good or I'm really bad, one or the other. Good question. Actually not. Um, a document is always a moment, but we collect inside the moment the count of likes and we also um, um, collect a couple of likes, right, relative to your friends. So every time someone likes in the system, we have to go to every moment as it exists in your newsfeed and say, does this person your friend? Oh, well then I'll display it in one of the likes. You know, it's like on Facebook. It doesn't show you every like. It shows you a couple. 
and we try to show you likes that are relevant. So each document in the newsfeed solar index is actually a romantic moment as it appears in somebody's newsfeed, and then it'll have like and comment summary information as just fields in it. A lot of companies, what they'll do is they'll, and this is why solar supports like, and um, you can get the parent-child relation as you know, it never ends, um, right? Is that they're just gonna basically, you know, you only have one table in a solar index, and so you just jam all the columns for every table you really want in one table. And what we do instead, at least in terms of this hierarchical data, like because a moment can have multiple likes, a moment can have multiple comments, is we'll, we'll do the summary information for the likes, because that's not much information. And for comments, we'll take your top five and we'll uh, JSON encode it and put it in one field. We wanted fetches to be fast. We didn't want to have to go to every master in order to pull the moments in your news feed. So we always propagate. We let the update be expensive. We propagate the moment at that way. That's why we get six million a day, because there's a lot of people who are friends. So that may go, if this was multi-master, it might go to several um, masters. But it's guaranteed when the user comes in and asks for his news feed, he's only going to go to one just thing, the box door. one master. It's going to be a real simple query, you know, recipient ID, colon, number, boom, here's your 100 or so news feed items. Our updates are cheaper than what this is showing, which is, you know, pretty low. But still, it's, it's still like, it can be one to two seconds. And um, in fact, I'll even show you that. Where, where is it right now? Back over to real world production data. Uh, right now I think this is running on uh, SP, whoa, I clicked the wrong, sorry, wrong pull down. Solar, this one. Uh, oh, you know something else I didn't mention? You know, I talked a lot about scaling out, but let me tell you something, friends. Scaling up is pretty important, too. We sim link our, our data directory to SSDs. Yeah, do that. That's a good idea. A little over one and a half updates per second. Remember, those are commits in batch size 400. And as you can see, our average time per request is around 744 milliseconds. Again, that's 100. Um, no, I'm sorry, 400. Uh, different ads or deletes happening at once. Uh, a trick, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but a trick that um, some of the, you know, we work closely with Lucid Imagination. You know, they give us a lot of insight and tell. And uh, one of the tricks they, they told us to do is, if you're going to query, try not to query the master, but if you are going to query the master, don't sort. So that's just one of the things we do to try to keep uh, from commits being real long, from taking a real long time. Thank you so much. If you're interested in what I had to say, here's some URLs that you can uh, take a look at. If you're into this kind of thing and you like this and you live in the Bay Area or want to live in the Bay Area, we are always hiring, I should add, at this point in time. If you're into that sort of thing, feel free to drop me a line and let me know if you're interested or not. Thanks again.